Hello everyone, it's Wayne Jones, the Course Coordinator for Statutory Interpretation. Just some comments about Chapter 1 in case you were tempted to jump the um, uh, that chapter in the textbook. It is very much introductory, but there are about three or four comments I wanted to make about some uh, major issues which will make sense of the next 12 weeks if you pick up on them. First of all, note the comments regarding legislation and the, the common law. Why are we doing statutory interpretation? Well, essentially because legislation is such a prominent source of law these days. Firstly, so much of the new law is made not through common law but through, through um, the introduction of new legislation. And secondly, because so many cases which uh, come to court rely on an element of statutory interpretation for an outcome. A good example might be a, a simple accident at work. Uh, the question may well be whether there's been any negligence. Part of the resolution of that problem might involve deciding whether there's been negligence in accordance with some statute. So for example, um, whether workplace um, health and safety legislation has been breached. Second thing is, have a look at the role of the courts in statutory interpretation, very much limited by the separation of powers document. So a court cannot improve or rewrite or develop the law, that's not its role. What it's there for is to interpret the law, it's, it's to interpret the legislation. And so what that means is that uh, although there are some comments that have been made over the page about the historical basis for the conflict between common law and, um, st and uh, statute, really these days the, the big issue is um, uh, the role of the courts in the light of the separation of powers doc uh, doctrine. So not there to make new law, really there to interpret. And so uh, that's why I think we're going to find that um, uh, statutory interpretation is such an important area, those, those two issues alone. Um, next point, start making a dictionary of terms. I think you'll find that useful. Um, the two that are mentioned straight up in the first chapter um, are the terms interpretation or construction. Um, up to you, well your call really, but the textbook authors suggest that interpretation is normally used when you're talking about a single word, whereas construction is more about the whole section or the whole provision. So um, just yeah, just a hint, just a suggestion, start making a dictionary of, uh, of terms of your own so that you can quickly refer back to those, uh, the, the terms that you're going to see pop up uh, a lot over the next 12 weeks. Generally, with respect though to statutes and common law, I think the, the proposition is going to be that uh, statutes uh, do take a superior position. They are the, the superior source of law. They um, are simply open to interpretation by the courts. The question is going to be for you as you go through the next 12 weeks, which of these approaches suggested by Roscoe Pound is in play? So I won't go through them all here, but they appear in the uh, textbook at page 5. Uh, um, uh, statutes to be tra uh, treated as superior sources of law, to be applied in full, both in rule and in principle. Um, or go down to the bottom of the list, do you just give them direct effect, apply them very strictly and always give them a very narrow interpretation? Well the answer is probably no to the last one. It's going to be somewhere in that spectrum but uh, they are going to vary from case to case. And what judges do is discussed in the subheading the role of the judiciary in interpreting legislation. Now that starts at about page 6 in the introductory uh, chapter. Note the comments about um, the spectrums, the spectrum of um, approaches that you'll see in any decision and have a look at the comments for example regarding Gemini Gas Networks um, against the Mine Subsidence Board. Court was looking at whether or not um, a company which had jumped in early and done some remedial work before the subsidence happened was still going to be entitled to some compensation. Sounded common sense and yet you'll see there the comment that although uh, most of the judges tried to adjust the ordinary meaning of the words um, in the light of 
the purpose of the statute, one judge at least, Justice Bell in dissent, said, no, all I can do is apply the ordinary grammatical meaning of the provision and really if that leads to an unreasonable result, well, that's not my problem. That's something for the legislature to sort out. I'm just here to interpret the, uh, the law. Um, note also the comments regarding um, former Justice Michael Kirby, very much a judicial activist who was quite happy to look beyond um, even the, the purpose and meaning of the legislation to say, uh, particularly in the area that we'll cover uh, a bit later on, um, around chapters 11 and 12, talking about fundamental human rights, Justice Kirby's a great one for arguing that, well, if the government has signed up various um, um, human rights treaties, then uh, that's how we should interpret uh, any law that the, the government makes after that point, by taking into account what those treaties have got to say. So surely you don't, surely the government uh, wouldn't be making laws that were contrary to, uh, to treaties about basic human rights. But more, more about that a few chapters down the track. But for now, just note those comments about the, the arguments for and against formalism, reading the black letter, or judicial activism, uh, meaning that you're trying to make the law um, uh, serve justice between the, the parties. Uh, and look, one final comment on that chapter. Um, have a look at the question of precedent. I agree with uh, the textbook authors that um, the situation is that when a phrase or a word is interpreted in one act, it is not necessarily going to have exactly the same interpretation for another act. So to give you a, a made-up example, if, um, for example, the courts had to determine the meaning of the word motor vehicle um, under trade practices legislation, and, and they did come up with, um, uh, with a meaning, it would not necessarily be binding if the court was asked to come up with a similar definition, say, in the... Um, criminal code. So anyway, have a look at that, um, but, but just bear that in mind that uh, the words are always defined in the context in which they are used. And we'll talk about context um, down the track uh, in uh, a couple of weeks' time. But um, they're my comments on that first chapter. There's just a couple of things to note which will stand you in good stead for the next 12 weeks. Thanks for listening. Next week we'll talk about um, uh, in Chapter 2, we'll talk about creation of legislation.